Hello, everybody, and welcome to Camel City Chat. I'm John McPherson, and I am so lucky to be with one of my mentors, Lee Thomas Brown. Lee's out of Charlotte, North Carolina, the Concord area, and I'm so lucky to have her on today. And I uh, wanted to ask you some questions, Lee. It's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get much time because you're busy all the time and helping out clients and also your involvement. And I just, uh, I'm, 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 pre- I'm feeling pretty fortunate today that I get to ask you some questions. So to start off with, Lee. Listen, can I thank you first? Because you agreed to do this with me. So thank you because no, we come on. together. So Lee, I normally ask some questions about your favorite place to eat and stuff like that, but let's cut to the chase since, since I really want to get it and talk about you. And the reason why is, is, is you have this great podcast. It's called crazy. And I can't understand what the emojis stand for. It's crazy. Shit. Crap real- I had okay, to make a little asterisk because of the internet police. Well, I, I will tell you right now. Um, it's a great podcast. You interview some real, real cool people, but, You've never interviewed yourself. So I get, to, I get to ask you the questions. I'm so excited about this. But let's start off with this. Lee, how long have you been in real estate? This is my 20th year, John. My 20th, my 20th year of full time. I actually got my license three years before I became a full time realtor as a just in case thing. Just in case. Now, why did you get into real estate? Well, my dad made me, is yeah. part of the answer. Okay. Because he became I knew your a realtor. Dad was a realtor. Yeah. Yeah. 1978. So okay. growing up, I went to open houses and went to showings and helped do flyers and postcards and deliver paperwork because this was, of course, before fax machines and internet. So you had to hand deliver everything. Go get the keys but, from the office. Oh yeah, we had a, had a there was a keyboard. I forgot about the keyboard in the office. In so fact, 1978, your dad took you around as an infant, then, right? Um, but maybe I wasn't even born. I probably got that wrong because only Claire all knows how old I am. You keep, yeah, that's one of your best lines too, is, is, is Clara knows how. But it's how I know who. Look at this. This is what, this happened when I got into real estate. I know. I mean, we were all young and didn't have this before we got into real estate. Let me tighten that up a little bit while I talk. Get the serum out. Right. This is cheaper than Botox. Oh, come on. You look fine. So you got into real estate to kind of help dad out and it was your dad's, uh, business that, I mean, I, I hear wonderful things about your father and um, he, he's instilled some some pretty cool things in you. And one of which is I was fortunate enough to go see Freddie Cole uh, in Concord. Um, and it was so funny because I was getting up and I was leaving. And I told one of the ladies, oh yeah, um, I was excited about coming down here because this is where my friend Lee Thomas Brown lives. And they're like, well, you know, her dad was two seats over from you. And I'm like, pardon me? And they're like, no, your dad, her dad was sitting. I'm like, why didn't anyone tell me? She goes, well, you're just telling us now. He's already left. Your dad's, <laughs> your, your dad taught you something. Uh, the two things that your dad taught you, and one of which I am, I, I, actually, I'd, I'd love to teach my daughter both of them. But the most important thing was that, that I think that your dad taught you is, is Lee, you're Lee. You're not male, female. You're a realtor. Kick butt, take names, do your job. And I, I think that, that he taught you to be just Lee. Well, actually, I am a girl because he also taught me there's only two genders. Can we say that out loud anymore? Are we going to get in trouble with the woke police? You're going to be fine. Go ahead. <laughs> but, but my dad did raise me and my sister to just go do. Right. And when I joined him in real estate, it was never about be what other people tell you to be. It's just, you know, do your own thing. I always take care of people. So my dad told me from day one if you take care of people first, the money will figure itself out. And a lot of people in real estate, as you know, and I hate this about it, but it's the truth. They're always chasing the dollar. And because they're always chasing the dollar, sometimes they forget that there's human lives involved. And so he was very, very persistent about making sure I remembered that all the time, which is also why he insisted that we always work every price point that came in. And that was actually great to have as a basis because when the great recession hit in 07 because i never said no to any size deal whether it was a trailer house or a big fancy house on the lake my business actually grew during the downturn because as you remember baby because i don't know how old you are in real estate you know but if you remember during the recession there were a lot of realtors who only worked certain houses and only worked certain price ranges and then they went out of business because they weren't working with regular people. And my dad always told me to remember what an honor it is when somebody calls you because the house is a big deal to them. And that's, that's something I think every realtor needs to learn earlier rather than later in their careers. And I got to, I got to learn it on day one, which was pretty helpful. 
I, I, say, I tell people I'm a blue collar realtor and my penny, my, my bank takes pennies. You know, if I, my, my first sale was a, a $72,000 double wide trailer on 2.2 acres up on Shacktown road, uh, about 30 minutes from here. No, um, I bet it's worth more money today than it was then. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sherry Brevik was the first one to buy it. And of course you um, may have seen this. Uh, um, I haven't sent the speech to you, but my first ever client, um, uh, Crystal Renee Sparks was at uh, my inauguration this last week with her husband. Uh, they've accounted for 15 sides plus in my real estate career. Which is what happens when you take care of people over the years. And you try to, I, yeah. The, the very first house I sold was to the Sebas, and they spent $145,000 on that house. And mm -hmm. they have since, of course, sold it and moved. They named their daughter has my name because we became really good friends. That's one of my happiest that Kristen Lee is my sake after I sold a house to her parents and then I sold a house to their parents and man, it just, you know, it's good stuff that we get to do. Right. But thinking about this and in Cabarrus County, when I got in full time in 2000, the average price point was 148 and today in 2020 it's 266. Wow. I can think when a buyer inquiry comes in, like somebody, I want to spend up to a hundred. I'll think, man, back when I got into the business, I could really find you a decent, cute house for under a hundred. And now right. there's still a little bit of stuff under a hundred, but it's not quality. Well, man, also, this makes me wish I'd have personally bought more real estate over these few years. That is a regret. That is a regret there for, I think, a lot of people in the industry. I've got a client right now, and uh, he's like, man, Winston-Salem's on hold for me. I, I, um, there's just not enough inventory, and everybody wants too much for their houses right now. He's an investor, and I can appreciate that. So, um, you know, and, and obviously earlier when I was saying that's okay or whatever, I thought you were going to curse again. So, but it's, it's, you know, it is funny. One of your greatest assets is is you speak the truth. I mean, you speak how you feel um, and uh, you don't hold back punches. I think uh, the other great thing that I, I admire about you is, is, you know, um, while you may come off uh, as tough exterior or something, there is no one that you would rather fight for than, you know, be it race, religion, color, national origin, age, media, status, whatever. You, you are there for your clients and truly, truly, truly help anybody in any, any situation. Well, you know, John, they're all our neighbors. All these humans that are around us are our neighbors. And it, it frustrates me sometimes that there's realtors who lose track of that because they're thinking about the next deal, the next deal, the next deal. And the price, the price, the price. Right. And we have to remember that it might not be about the next deal. It's just about what's the best thing for our neighbor over here. And maybe that's a Habitat homeowner of the future and I won't make any money, but I need to take care of their needs because their kids may need to grow up and be mayor of my town and I want to be a part of their story. And so when you start thinking about real estate and realtor life, as in you're taking care of neighbors, the business will find you. It's not rocket science that if you do the best thing by everybody, people will be drawn to that. It's, it's pull marketing. So I learned that a long time too, is that most realtors do push marketing calendars and recipe cards. And here's who I am. I'm number one. And I flipped that script a long time ago. Actually, about the time of the recession, I had to flip out of that and do something different because the business. And so I went from doing marketing because I was all ego the first few years of my business to doing pull marketing that says, here's who I am. Here's what I'm going to do. Let me ask more questions. Let me find out about you so that I can serve you. And so that was a big shift in my business. My business grew. That was the coolest part is that making it more neighbor centric and less lease centric made my business bigger. And I've been very fortunate to have sold close to 3000 houses in my 20 years. And that's a lot. Wow. That is, I, you know, I, I, I got excited when I got to the point where I was selling you know, one a week, you know, it's a big deal because most yeah. realtors sell eight a year. So you sell one a week, you are head and shoulders above your competitors and it's not because you're chasing the transactions because you're doing your level best to help people. And that's the, that's the fun part that 20 years will show you. And I love telling people too, that in the first couple of years, you're scrambling and scrapping, you work seven days a week and you will cold call and knock on doors and do all the stuff to grow the business. 
And by year 10, your phone is ringing because people now know who you are and how you conduct business. And whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, you're going to draw people to you based on the way that you conduct business. And I must have done something okay because people who call me are amazing of my clients. I get to, I, I did a closing yesterday, just now got the email invite to their party. So I get to go over and hang out with them and take them some adult beverages and celebrate That's who you attract. And at year 20, now I'm figuring out what's next because it changes a lot. And of course, when I got in 20 years ago, we didn't have cell phones except for the expensive bag phone in the car. We had just gotten a pager because that was hip and cool. I had email because I had gotten it in college. And so I was ahead of the curve on email. We had just built a website but we still had a dot matrix printer. We still had the MLS book because we had green screen MLS right. and no, not everybody used green screen MLS. And so we had both. And when we had an offer, we would carry it over to meet an agent. And in Concord, the place that contracts were delivered, let's go meet that agent. And we went over to meet her at the dumpster where there were two other state deals going on because that's where people just generally met safe location, well-lighted popular parking lot to exchange paperwork, shake hands because realtors shook hands with each other back then, which is one of the changes I've seen in 20 years that I would go backwards on and say, we did better transactions with each other when the realtors knew each other better and we weren't just emails and text and faxes. And well, that's not even faxes anymore, just text and emails now. Maybe yeah, Facebook that's one of the messages. things. Those don't really. That's one of the things I will tell you that um, as as we had, and I, I owe you that uh, email, um, the speech. I talked about engagement, and if I know if I know you, if if I love you, I trust you, whatever. Um, it's amazing how much smoother a transaction goes when we know the other agent on the other end, because you know in the end we're basically negotiators and yeomen. But uh, you know it, it it's just. It's so nice when I know, oh, well, gosh, uh, you know, uh, Lee's kid just did this or something from Facebook. And, and I can say, you know, how's your daughter doing? And, you know, uh, how was Gettysburg when you guys went and or, or whatever that was. And then we have the conversation. It's like, OK, so this is my person's wanting to do. And you are so much more, uh, you know, it's, well, John, you know, honestly, this is where my seller is. This is what they're liking, blah, 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 blah. And then the deal's done and it's over with. You're not trying to get people. That's what I don't like. I don't like blood on the table. I've never been one mm -hmm. of those negotiator types because I really don't think we negotiate in real estate. I think we're just bringing people together and figuring out the reasonable best place for my clients based on what your clients are willing to do. And that's more of a meeting of the minds. If you're out to leave blood on the table, you're going to win on occasion. But at some point, you're going to be the one on the table. And I don't want that. You get a reputation too. That's the other thing that happens. And so what I would say is, pardon me? I don't need any more reputation. Yeah. All right. So I got, I've got some other crazy questions for you because I want to, well, unfortunately what's happened is, is we've had some, I don't know if you've had it on your end, but I've had a little breakup on some of the audio throughout the interview um, as we're recording. Are you getting that on your end? Occasionally we go into a tin can and back out. So we'll see what happens. Okay, cool. All right. So here, uh, I want to ask some other questions. All right. So you grew up where in the Concord area? So if you know where Concord Mills Mall is, that's exit 49 on yep. I-85. My family farm was just as you go left off the exit, just past Concord Mills. And we, our stuff started there where you see Christenberry Parkway because I'm a Christenberry and the Christenberry neighborhood was where I grew up. My house I grew up in is now gone because it's been replaced by some million dollar swanky houses. My grandparents' house is gone, but our fishing pond is still there. My aunt and uncle are still there. And I remember when they built that exit on 85. And I remember when they built Harris Boulevard right there in the university area because my dad and I used to bird hunt down where they built the highway. Okay. I've All lived right. here forever. All right. And by the way, one of the best deals on a flight you can get is from the Concord airport to New Orleans. You know that, right? Well, yes. As long 
long as you're not under any schedule constraints because they fly when they feel like it and they come back they do, when they feel they do like cancel it. cancel quite, but, quite. That's why you can fly, fly on Allegiant for like a dollar for that. Yeah, you, you, uh, a dollar and a prayer. Um, but no, uh, so I've had the opportunity to fly out of there to go to New Orleans for something and I was just like, this is the greatest airport in the world. Um, and uh, so, all right, where did you go to college? As if I need to ask, but I'm going to ask. Well, I graduated from Northwest Cabarrus High School, and that's one of my favorite Facebook groups is all of the alumni from my high school, because I do love that Concord might be a big city now in mm -hmm. terms of North Carolina, but we're still a small town. And I went to Florida State University on a full scholarship. Okay. And I was down there, was an academic scholarship, music concentration. And then I got homesick and transferred back to Chapel Hill and got there. We go. That's what I was waiting for. Okay. But because, and I had a full ride at Carolina because I was a, I'm, oh, I'm still a big nerd. What am I talking about? And I gave up my Carolina scholarship to take the Florida State one because I was chasing the music school. But when I transferred, of course, I lost all my scholarship. And I said, We're so glad you're coming back. Figure out how to pay for it because. It was my decision. I gave up my scholarships. And so I bartended to pay for school, which is how I got to know Michael Jordan and Dean Smith and Woody Durham because I bartended at Damon's. Well, I actually got to know Mike Krzyzewski there, which I don't care for him. But I was over at the Governor's Club, which is the Schwanky Schwank neighborhood in Chapel Hill. Right. And I actually kept up with some of my regulars from the Governor's Club until they died last year, which was one of those things I took with me into real estate because I would send Christmas cards to these people that I had known since the 90s. And that's what you do in real estate. You continually follow up with people and you send birthday cards and Christmas cards and go see them and see them at the ball field and see them at the July 4th parade in Harrisburg and hug their necks. And right. that's what my dad taught me early on is that you just continually take care of people. And actually not just my dad, my uncle had an insurance office and uncle Gene used to send a birthday card to everybody he knew every year on their birthday. And I still have mine. He's been dead now for almost 30 years, but I've got um, all the birthday cards he sent me and I need to get better about birthday cards because if there's anything I know about 20 years in real estate, it's that I have to keep getting better because there's always somebody nipping at my heels. We've got some great people in the business in Concord and they keep getting better. So I have to keep changing my game up too. Well, and it's funny because I, uh, I had a lot of people that were making remarks at something recently. Um, I, it was at the inaugural and they were talking about, well, John sent me a birthday card. John sent me a birthday card. I am so far behind on birthday cards. I think I'm like four months behind. And so what I do is I put a dollar scratch off in with it and that's their birthday gift for me. And so, you know, people, we don't think it's, yeah, I'm just doing a birthday card, but to other people, the things that we do in the industry that as our clients, they just think it's, you know, great. And we don't even, th it's, it's like you and your, um, uh, you know, the, the fruitcake that doesn't have anything in it. Um, you know, there are people that purposely try to send you a referral because they want that, that fruitcake. And, um, you know, what I will tell you is this, is um, I've learned in working with you that you really care for people. You really try to, um, you're definitely the person that grabs the ladder and reaches back and tries to pull people up. And so um, I want to ask some questions that I know are very realtor specific, but um, I think people need to know about you. The first is, I noticed the pearls, but but what is that little, gosh, I feel like I'm putting a T on a T ball here. I mean, a ball on a T here, right? I, I, yeah. So what is that little thing there that, what, what is that? I don't know. I don't recognize that. That's because one day you'll have one like this yourself. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm fine with the golden one, but no. So tell me about platinum R and, and well, R. Most expensive piece of jewelry that's a, Platinum R, R pack pin, President Circle, $50,000 Hall of Fame. And what that means is I am so committed to property rights and to protecting and preserving the American dream that I take dollars out of my bank account and help fund the political advocacy efforts that the realtors do on behalf of every neighbor in our communities. And when I got to interrupt. Yes. And this is just money out of your, co your company that you write off, right? This is out of my pocketbook You're and it's personal. why I drive regular GMC with a hundred thousand miles on it instead of a Shishi Mercedes or BMW, which are probably leash anyway, but I don't drive an expensive car. 
invest in this because without this, I don't have that, this house, my kids don't have the extracurricular things that they have because real estate's given me everything. And I have to protect my kids to own a house because currently in 2020, we're in a presidential election year and there is a candidate on- There's a candidate what? I hope you saw the Project Veritas video, but we have a candidate for president right now on one of the primary tickets whose campaign staff was discussing how landlords should be abolished. And whether or not that kind of extreme thing would ever happen, the reality is whenever that conversation enters the public discourse, it can turn into all kinds of negative things. And I know that you need landlords because first of all, real estate's an amazing investment vehicle. Second of all, with good landlords, you have somewhere for people to live. And we know that everybody wants to have a safe, stable place to live. And ideally, the third thing that happens is that tenant who has a safe, stable place to live can one day buy their own property and have some financial stability. So I stay politically involved because if I don't, I have to ask myself who will. And I can't let the crazy people be the only ones with a voice at the table. I know as a realtor what it takes to survive because I have to earn commission dollars to feed my family. And I know what real estate has done for me, not just in terms of a business perspective, but for what I have in the way of our first houses, which were tiny and inexpensive and how we were able to fix those up and then move into larger houses. And we are building some financial stability. I'm not a one percenter or a super billionaire. I didn't come from a ton of money. I came from two hardworking people who are children of farm families. And so we've lived the life of cutting the Kool-Aid in half and having hot dogs and eggs for supper. And so I know that if I want to give a different path to the future, it comes with a real estate foundation. I'm protecting that right now. And I will tell you, there's a lot of very bad political ideas floating around. And I think the person you want at the table is your realtor, no matter whether they're on the R or D side of the aisle. As realtors, we don't care politically what party you're with. We just care what you do when it comes to your neighbor's desire to own a piece of the American dream. Now, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. Uh, uh, uh. But you know, that's, that's such a cheesy phrase and cheesy phrases drive me crazy because it's not the reality. But it so does, I look at it. This way. I was going to say, it does make you aware that you need to be there. Kind of, except that when we start using the same tired phrases all the time, people tune us out. And so if you think instead of terms like sign ordinances, people hate sign ordinances. Oh, you want to have a yard sale, but you can't because your HOA said you can't. Well, it's realtors that go to bat for you so you can advertise your yard sale because that's your house and you're right. Airbnb is a very hot topic right now. Do you think you should be able to rent a room in your house to somebody who's on vacation in town for the Republican National Convention? Because in Charlotte in August this year, we're going to have the RNC and they've already put out the word, we need 50,000 rooms. Well, that means we need people to Airbnb their investment properties because we don't have enough hotel rooms. So if I have a room over my garage, am I allowed to rent it out for a week? We, the realtors say, it's your house, do what you want. Your government says, no, we're going to tell you what you can do. And so that's when you realize that realtors have to have a voice because you, the regular person, are too busy chauffeuring your kids to basketball practice and overseeing homework and going to work and doing your laundry to pay attention to this stuff. We do pay attention. And so when I write checks, it's to pay for lobbyists and to pay for postcards and messaging to make sure that we make our voices heard. And when I make my voice heard, it's all those 3,000 people I've represented in 20 years, I'm making their voices heard. It's all the 3,000 people that were on the other side of the table whose agents may or may not still be in the business, I'm making their voices heard. And I think we forget that sometimes as realtors, we're not just speaking for ourselves when we're talking about things. You're speaking for this profession, but also for every client you've ever served or intend to serve. All right. So we've talked about a little bit about a couple of things. Now, this is one that I, that I like because you've, you've tried to get me to come to this. Uh, I think I was driving through town one day. All right. So tell me about, tell me about Lee and her involvement. Now we're going to start off with locally. Why are you taking pictures of that thing again? We're going to start off with locally. Instagram. I'm a social media person. Be quiet. All right. We're going to start off with locally. Then we're going to start off. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, um, in the Realtor Association and then, you know, politically, maybe let's, how, how about we try that? So locally, 
Um, what is it? Your church does a barbecue and you invite like half the nation to it or something like that. What is that? We don't even have to invite them. They show up. I go to Mallard. Well, I don't go there right now. I grew up at Mallard Creek Presbyterian. You're a, you're a member there, but uh, are you a member there? That's what I always tell people. Is I'm a member of Augsburg Lutheran. Um, I don't a member or not. They may have okay. chased me off the rolls because we've been okay. Baptist now for four years. So the, um, that's, a, that's a different discussion. So that's my lifelong church. So my grandparents helped build it. And it's the oldest barbecue in North Carolina and the largest. So in one day, we serve 20,000 people. And because it falls the fourth Thursday in October, it always draws a lot of candidates for public office because they can get in front of a lot of voters at one right. shot. But I have always been very involved in my church. I did the children's music for 16 years. I've taught Sunday school to every age group, although, spoiler alert, the really old people are my favorites, even though I'm losing some of my old friends, which just drives me crazy. But I love doing that. And a volunteer in the nursery and I cook and all that stuff because I'm an old Southern woman, you know, wear pearls right. and stuff. I love it. But with the realtor world, when I got in as a realtor, I didn't pay any attention to the association because I thought that's just what you have to do to have access to the multiple listing service. And so you never I'm go just, sell a house to a realtor. Why you want to be involved? And I never heard that. Oh, no, I did. All I heard was those people down there aren't selling anything. Yeah. So I didn't mess with those people. And that should have been my first alarm bell because I kind of hate the phrase those people because that means right. you're categorizing a whole group that you don't know. Right. But I was in 2009. I was at number one in Charlotte because that was my goal was to be number one in the association for sales. And I was hoofing it to sell more houses. And I got a call 2009, of course, being a really awful year for real estate because prices were still going down. You're dealing with short sales and foreclosures and just general panic in the marketplace. And I get a call from a volunteer at the association who asked me to give $99 to RPAC. And I said, why? And they said, because you ought to. So I said, okay. So I gave my $99, joined the $99 club, and I still have that pen. And then I got voluntold on the Government Affairs Committee, which is what happens in volunteer life in many spaces. If you don't say no quickly enough, then automatically you've said yes. And then I got involved in the Government Affairs Committee and found out exactly what realtors do because prior to that interaction, I didn't know this existed. I didn't know that we did political advocacy work. So I spent nine of my 20 years just selling houses, disengaged from the, the real process and the real work of protecting the future of this profession and of the clients we serve, which is part of why I doubled down as soon as I got involved and I started becoming a national volunteer and a state volunteer and I've at this point served in uh, so many capacities. I can't hardly name them all. And it's an honor to serve because every time you're in that space, you get to learn from other realtors and you then can bring that message back to your community and to your clients and make their experience better in real estate, which is pretty much always the goal. Well, I mean, you, you saw me go like this. You knew what I was going to say. It seems like that you were told to get involved with RPAC a little differently than I was. Um, I shook my long bony finger at you. Yeah, there were some choice words that went with it as well, too. Um, yeah, get, your, get it over on your side. Um, See how long uh, my bony finger is when I do that across the screen? So um, right now you're... Uh, <coughs> chair of legislative for the state of North Carolina. Yes, which means I get to work with a team of realtors to bring the message of what's happening to our <laughs> state me. elected officials, our House of Representatives and our Senate, so that they know what realtors think about the legislation on their desks. And for reference, we had over 350 pieces of legislation just in North Carolina last year that affected property rights. And when you think about that, there's also the other stuff that's out there. So our elected officials are facing over 900 pieces of legislation, which means even the smartest ones are overwhelmed because right. our legislators are part-time legislators, even though they're working full time. And so they don't know what all's on their desk unless somebody pulls them aside and says, just so you know, here's what the skinny is on this one. And here's what it means to your constituency. So our legislative committee at North Carolina, that's what we do is help take that message from our lobbying team make it really good sound bites and understandable pieces for our elected officials. And then we work together to educate those people so they make better decisions for our communities. Mm -hmm. Well, I I'm very blessed 
in the sense that I, I, I've gotten on a couple good committees and, and yeah, I may not, I'm on your legislative committee. I'm also an SPC and, uh, my, uh, my, um, Senator that I represent was at my inaugural. Oh, so yeah. that was, that was a lot of fun. And, and, uh, in fact, uh, we're getting together here later this week and just, uh, it's, it's an opportunity that, um, has, has made me learn more about my state. Um, and I think that that's a, a really neat thing to do that. On well, the we federal probably level, tell people SPC is a state political coordinator, meaning John is the go-to realtor person for his senator so that that person has one point of contact with an organization as large as this one because the realtors are the largest grassroots organization in North Carolina. And we also impact a lot of the economic pieces in urban, rural, suburban communities. And so we are pretty critical con conduits. I, I like the fact that 90, I'd say 90% of the time, we're not fighting for ourselves, we're fighting for our clients. I mean, you know what, okay, the big time, oh, you know, we, we were real horrible. We fought for association healthcare. Wait a minute, that affects every other association too. I mean, you know, so it, it's, it is amazing to me, you know, when people don't think about it, when you sell your house, there's, there's no tax on selling your house, but however you pay deed stance, which is actually a tax on selling your house, and they try to double it and we fight it down. Um, more is tax deduction. It's not on deductible. Way. It goes into the black hole, which is right. known as the general fund. And if you know right. anything about politics, beware of anything that goes to the general fund. Mm -hmm. Now, all right, on the federal level, are you not somebody's, what, what's your new position there? Are you an, um, cause I've saw you around at a lot of the different events. Are you an advisor to somebody or you, I mean, it's not like you introduced uh, Condoleezza Rice recently at an event or something like that. Love her so much. Oh, she's one of my favorites. You ready for Caroline Kennedy. I think she's going to be phenomenal. Huh? No, I'm, I'll tell you who I'm, I enjoyed one of the best speakers was, um, oh gosh, what's his name from uh, Cal Penn. I loved Cal Penn. I thought he was hilarious. He was funny, but um, You're I showing like it something better when, when humor goes both directions. I like bi-directional humor, not right. singular directional humor. Okay. And that's why I like Condoleezza Rice because she is so balanced and she is so data and information driven. She oh, you're not fact, that at all. I'm all about facts, not feelings. But I will say that I'm not a federal political coordinator, although the federal political coordinator or FPC for Representative Richard Hudson is Bradley Cohen, who works in my office. I just happen to have a whole lot of connections on Capitol Hill because I did unsuccessfully run for Congress. But prior to that, I just know all their cell phone numbers and I call them and talk right. to them. And I think a lot of people forget that your elected you're, officials you're a are non-designated FPC. I'm a, yeah, I'm an unofficial busy body, yeah. but right. you know, I think we forget that they're not just people you should yell at on Facebook, but if you call them and talk to them and get to know their families and what matters to them, but their business background is, then they're more willing to listen to you when you have something you'd like to ask about or give input on. And one of those individuals for me is Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. Tim's become a friend Great of mine. Because He's been a realtor champion. He's done a ton of stuff for the realtors because his business partner, Michael Sally, is a realtor. Tim has a background in insurance and real estate, so he understands the profession. And I'm not in South Carolina. I'm not in his district. And I don't really have, he doesn't have a reason to listen to me except that I can bring him policy information from the realtors and I can help support his fundraising and reelection efforts. And I want him to get elected because he's amazing. Mm -hmm. and, I wish I lived in his district, but you know, you can get a hold of elected officials if you call them. And if you're not an asshole yelling at them, you just got to be a decent human, be a right. realtor. Well, human. My, my SP. So, so my Senator is a different political party. Okay. And I wasn't even in his district. Now I'm in his district and I'm voting for him. I mean, he's, he's a realtor champion. It's, it's amazing to me. We were talking about the, the, you know, the private roads database. He calls a buddy of his while I'm in the office at, um, uh, DOT and the guys telling, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. No, this is what we should do and all this kind of stuff. Walk out, Mark Zimmerman talks to him and he's like, oh, I'll support that. You're crazy. That's awesome. And so, I mean, we just have such a great staff and group of people and individuals that we get the honor to work with. Um, it makes it easy for us. Exactly. All right. So we got to get some more Lee Brown in here. So um, you ran for the House of Representatives for the United States. What were you thinking? 
I was thinking that if you see an open door and you have the skills to do the job, if you don't throw your name in the hat, you'll never know if it's meant to be. And so there was a special election in 2019 in the ninth district. And I don't live in the ninth, but I live eight miles from it because it encompasses Charlotte all the way out to Lumberton and Robinson County, Bladen County. And I know I've sold a lot of houses, got family in that district. So I made a run for it and put my real estate business on hold and decided to make no money for a period of time and to spend an ungodly amount of money for an amount of time. But I now I know where the money in politics goes. It does not go into anybody's pocket. I can assure you of that. But it all goes to reaching people. If you think about it, 30 years ago, you could call people or you could knock on their door and get them. And now they hide from the door with their little nest doorbells and the ring doorbell. Phone. Hi, hi, it's Lee. Can you let me in to talk to you? That's what I did. I'm like, hey, that's who I am. Wearing a pen. I'm legit. Here's a card. But your money is going to outreach. Some people are on Facebook and some are on Twitter and some are on email and some are on telephone and some are door knocks. And so you have all these different ways you have to do outreach and they all cost money. But man, it was fun. It was fun to knock on doors and get to see people and do the retail politics the old school way. And I came in fourth out of 10, the primary, not as great as I wanted, but not bad. And I think if I'd have had six months, I'd have maybe had a chance to get there. But I was a newcomer, never been elected before. And it's hard. It's a, that's a hard learning curve to achieve. But I'm grateful that I put my name in the hat, stayed positive and talked about property rights issues that nobody talks about because housing policy is not sexy. But I, I felt like if I could get there, I could do the job because I'm a wonky person. I totally enjoy the policy work. And as a realtor, I'm very good at bringing people to middle ground, which we don't have right now. But, you know, who knows what will happen in the future. Uh, I, I don't think we've seen the end of that that side of Lee. Um, now, here's one that, that I, I get glimpses of but don't hear a lot about. What about this lady, this uh, national speaker slash trainer slash – uh, educator. Um, tell me more about that because, you know, I see bits and pieces of it, but I don't get, I don't get the full thing. I get to like the 30 minutes at a, a convention or something. Well, That's how did this start? Salem needs to hire me. Samuel needs to just spend the money because I am very expensive, but I am worth it. But, you know, I became a speaker by accident and this started in 2011 when I was asked to be on a panel of top producing realtors and I said no because I'm not a public speaker and I hate microphones and I was panicked like most people about public speaking but this gentleman who's he's the deceased now he insisted that I get on that panel he's like you need to tell him what you're doing because it's good and his name was Alan Hange he was a CRS instructor from the northern Virginia area and he died probably almost 10 years ago now but Alan hammered me to get behind that microphone and I did, and I'm ever grateful because that's when I discovered that I do have a talent for wordsmithing and I love public speaking. And I went from there, from being a first nine years of my business, I'm a super selfish, want to be number one, make all the money realtor. I get introduced to the association. I get introduced to speaking. And I realized that there's a far bigger impact and there's far more goodness to be had by sharing instead of just taking. So I actually make less money on real estate now than I did 10 years ago. I still sell plenty of houses, but it's not my number one goal. I do make a very good living off of my speaking business because that has grown. And now I'm able to watch other realtors expand their businesses and expand their lives and have better mentor relationships and better understand the depth and the breadth of real estate. So I, I can watch my impact scaling now in a different way than when I it was just a producing realtor. And so now I work a, a balance of still doing some listings and a few buyers and do a lot of speaking and a lot of volunteer work. So my life looks entirely different, but I love it when I get a message from a realtor. I just got one yesterday and he needed to get lifted up. And we're in a space in the society where getting lifted up is getting trickier and trickier because people aren't vulnerable enough to tell you what's going on in their lives. And I'll actually read to you what he sent me without his name. And he said, oh, I can't seem to get back on the horse. He's been a realtor for several years. Things I had no fear doing last year, I'm now terrified to do. Fisbos weren't an issue, but I'm too terrified to call them after being in the hospital last April. Okay, so this is January. This is almost a year ago. I'm having a terrible time getting back to work. I shouldn't admit that because realtors don't admit that. 
And so I asked for his phone number and I called him and he wasn't able to answer the phone or he screened me because we screen each other now. And I, you know, gave him some encouragement and gave him some action items to take. And then he wrote me back and said, thank you for taking the time to call me because we don't do that. And I, I love being able to do that as a mentor in the business. And he said that he had spoken to a jerk on the phone, but this helped him hang it up and call somebody else. And he said, God bless you today. You rock. I mean, I, I don't get that doing listings and buyers. I get to work with some listings and buyers, but when I speak, I can scale to thousands of people and maybe be a, a mentor and a resource to them because it was done for me. My dad mentored me. I was mentored by Jean Shine from Killing Texas and Carol Greco from Pennsylvania, or Philadelphia actually, and Orly Steinberg from New Jersey and Patrick Lilly from Manhattan and Buddy West from Delaware. These people have spent time and energy on me and so I have to give it back. And that's where I wish more realtors understood that there's nothing to be lost by sharing everything that you do, even locally, because real estate's big enough. None of us can handle all of the they're not buyers, do it. All the sellers in our market. Yeah, and they're not going to do it. I'm I can show you how to do everything I do, and you're not going to do half of it. But I have to hope that at some point, there's a few that will. And In any class of 300 people, I'll have two people that will implement and to me, that's two more than, than we're going to before I got there to speak to them. And I'd What's your largest crowd, you think, so far? Oh, the largest crowd would have been probably about 8,000. That's a pretty good-sized crowd. When was this at? And I've spoken on five continents, which I didn't expect that. So right. in the last 10 years, I've been in 49 states. North Dakota, I think, is going to crack this year. That's my one missing state five continents and realtors in all different languages. I taught the first classes in Japan and the first classes in Cambodia for real estate, which was really exciting to break ground there. Right. Taught classes in Vietnam. It was the first time they'd been taught in Vietnam and in the Philippines. I broke ground in the Philippines as well. So that was, I mean, it's, it's exciting. And it's, I want, it's never no, this is the, one money, that... the money's not there for that. It's just about the ability to, to, to shape the future. Mm -hmm. This is one that, that I don't think a lot of people realize that is an added benefit to what you do. Um, you meet people all over the world and they need an agent somewhere else. One of my great things is that I'm friends with you. And if someone's moving to this area, um, you're like, well, call John. So how many You've referrals? You've benefited a lot from knowing me. You've made a lot of money off of me, my friend. I've sent some back, I think, but I think you're in the more you're in the black more than I am. So, let, but um, and, and I hey, thank you. Um, sure. What? Uh, how many referrals did you send last year? Hmm, I don't know how many I sent because I Numbers, am known queen. As, Come on. Yeah, but I'm known as Lee from North Carolina, and so I do get calls from all over the place for. Who do you have in Wilmington? Who do you have in right. Salem? Who do you have in Asheville? And I don't get any compensation for that. The compensation I get is knowing that I have made a connection between great people and that the consumer buying and selling real estate is protected. Right. So those are just happies for me. And there, I guarantee there was at least 150 of those that I did last year. Right. And for me personally, we closed 43 referral transactions last year that were referrals from other agents. And that was a pretty decent piece of our business. That's great. That is really good. Yes, and especially um, just do eight sides a year period. The fact that we did five times that just on referrals worked out pretty good. And hopefully they're all happy. They seem to be. All right. So now what, what we were talking earlier, what, what is your position with the National Association of Realtors? Well, in 2020, I'm a member of the executive committee. And of course, right. they meet, look at proposals from committees and determine what goes before the board. And I'm very honored to serve in that capacity. It's my first time in that role, and it's a it's a very serious role. And luckily, I'm somebody who reads bylaws, minutes, and agendas, so I'm looking forward to that opportunity to serve. And then in 2021, I'll be the vice president for advocacy under President Charlie Oppler from New Jersey, and I'm super honored to support Great Charlie in this year and to help him with. He's got so many wonderful initiatives to take care of members in the public, and I'm very honored to support his his year. It's going to be good. So um, you're a numbers queen. I'm going to put you on the spot on something. Does the government in any way affect the price of a piece of real estate? The government is killing us on real estate. 
And what people don't understand is when we talk about an affordability crisis, it's actually an availability crisis. A good friend of mine pointed this out to me because we were talking, I have, I have a lot of wonky friends. The beauty of volunteering in real estate is you find people who are wired like you, who think through things. And then we can talk nerdy, nerdy stuff like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and housing affordability. And this friend of mine and I, we are on a personal mission to fix Section 8 reputation because Section 8 is a necessary program, but it has a bad rap. And so anyway, when you talk about housing affordability, there's a, a giant chunk that's causing the availability crisis because we should be replacing 1.7 million units annually. Instead, builders are building 1.4 because one thing that's happening with housing is that in addition to needing new stock for millennials forming households and immigrants coming in the legal way who can purchase real estate, you have housing stock that's deteriorated or dilapidated or destroyed by natural disasters. So we also, in addition to needing additional stock, we have replacement stock. And we don't talk about that at all unless it's time of a crisis. Like in Katrina, we knew how much of New Orleans housing stock was demolished because of the storm but you don't think about it in Winston-Salem where you have communities where houses have not been cared for in 60 years. They're literally falling down and they have to be removed for public safety. Well, you have to replace that stock because somebody has got to have somewhere to live. So as you look at the housing availability crisis, you kind of start to see what's happening with our builders and developers. Why are they only building expensive stuff? Hmm. Well, the cost of labor is up, yes. The cost of materials is up, yes. But what's up at an even larger rate, and it's exceeded the rate of inflation and wage increases, is the cost of regulatory burden. And in North Carolina, the average new construction house, so the average single family house, of course, the numbers would skew for multifamily properties, so we're not looking at that. But on a single family property, $48,000 of the price of that new build is wrapped up in regulatory burden. So if you've got a builder that wants to build $200,000 houses, which would be in reach of most people, whether they're on a 40 hour a week hourly pay or salary, because that's going to be less than their rent two incomes, we can do that. Well, that $200,000 house has $48,000 in regulatory burden. Now you look at labor and materials and the builder should make a profit because he can't work for free. So you people that want the builders to make less, stop it because their margins are already low. When you look at that, they can't build for 200,000. They have to build at 275 and three just to hit all those numbers. So what should happen? Well, as realtors, we're talking to our municipal leaders. We need neighbors to come with us and look at what's happening with the cost of permits and the number of times plans are sent back to the city for revision and the amount of required green space and the required this and the required that. I'm in the town of Harrisburg where my primary residence is located. We're in Cabarrus County. We're about this big, right off 485. And in Harrisburg, they passed an ordinance some several years ago that single family homes have to be on a minimum of a half acre. When you have to be on a minimum of a half acre, the affordability is gone because any builder that builds Doubles that neighborhood the price of a lot. They're required to, you're right, the, the per, how, per unit price on the lots has gone way higher and they have to have green space and curb and gutter and this runoff thing for environmental and this and that. You go down to Indian Trail at the edge of Union County and there's a crazy environmental overlay down there to protect an endangered freshwater mussel called the fiddleback mussel. And it stopped a massive amount of development about 15 years ago, which is I look at the 20 years in my real estate, it's not just the selling of houses, it's what I've seen in regulatory burden and overlays. And we lost an amazing development that would have been positive economic impact for that county to protect this muscle. Well, when they shut down the development, the next year we had the most intense drought we've seen in a hundred years. And what happened to the fiddleback muscle? Is gone because the drought got it. And the crazy part is the developer who wanted to come in had all of these cool environmental designs for protecting wetlands and doing some natural water features that would have saved that freshwater fiddleback muscle if the developer had been allowed to do it the right way, but instead they got shut down by bullshit environmental regulations. We've seen the same thing at Lake Norman where there's an endangered shrub called the button bush. I still can't figure out for the life of me 
how a shrub is endangered. But anytime you put that overlay on, it starts to jack up the cost of building, which makes housing out of reach of regular people. And so I am I'm obviously getting very soapboxy about this because I'm on fire about how our local elected officials are causing the problem they state they want to fix because they start getting all focused on, we got to help people. But then one screamy neighbor comes in with NIMBY, not in my backyard. We don't want density. We don't want this. We don't want that. Well, they give in to the one screamy person, which is why as realtors, we have to be showing up and saying, that's not the best solution possible and bring the boots on the ground perspective to that, which is probably why I, I do stay politically active and I have run for office because I do believe we should have more realtor perspective at the table. But here locally, I'm not running in 2020. I've, I'm a resource. And so every year I reach out to all my past clients and tell them if you need to know for whom to vote, I'll tell you. I know who the realtors support and it's not about any of your other hot button issues. I'm going to give you the realtor perspective and you can make a decision from that point because that's where I stay in my lane when it comes to making recommendations. Because obviously as a realtor, you don't really want to alienate people, but they need to be educated and you've got to be bold enough to do that. And that's where 20 years in the business comes in handy because I'm, if I lose a piece of business because I'm honest, that's okay. I can replace it with three others. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned your daughter earlier. So you're a baseball mom. So you know what this means, right? What is that? We don't that up. No, I didn't do that. I did this. Two outs. When they, yeah, that's, that's how they call two outs. They don't, they don't normally do it like this. They do it separated, I guess. Is that true? Uh, in softball, we can do two outs. Okay. All right. So, so, so we got two questions left. You ready? Okay. Question number one. Let me think about this of the two. I had them on my mind, and of course, now I can forget them. All right. No, I know what it is. Lee Thomas Brown, what is the craziest shit in real estate that ever happened to you? Um, I only have one story. Can I do a top couple? Because there's Lee, a top you can do couple. whatever you want. Well, I probably right. should do an episode on my own podcast because I do have my own stories to tell. But in the meantime, you people go ahead and sign up for the crazy shit in real estate podcast. It's available on iTunes and Spotify and wherever else you get your podcast. We'll, we'll put it down at the bottom of the screen here too, how to, you know, how to find you and all that stuff with your phone number too. Well, I've always told everybody else's stories instead of mine. And the couple of things that come to mind, there was a closing I went to, this is at least 17 years ago because this was before I had kids and I was representing the sellers and in North Carolina, we're of course an attorney state and quite often buyer and seller in the same room together. Well, here's the neighbor, here's trash day. And it's a generally pleasant conversation. Well, I'm sitting with my sellers right here. The attorney's in the middle. He had an L shaped table before he retired. My favorite attorney ever. And the buyer and buyer agents were over here and the sellers are sitting here. Buyers are getting their loan paperwork and the attorney's going over the loan paperwork. The wife worked for Harris Teeter. And so as a giant corporate company, Harris Teeter gave discounts on mortgages to their employees at this time. So she had gotten a really good deal from her employer. Well, her name was first on all the documents. And the husband saw that and came unglued. He wasn't signing nothing if his name wasn't first on every document and he'd be first and damn it, and he's standing up and he's yelling she's as embarrassed as any human I've ever seen. She's red in the face, about to cry. The attorney's like, oh my God, stop. And angry man gets up and walks out of the room. My sellers look at me like, are we closing? I said, I don't know. So just smile and sit still because I don't know what's happening right now. And so for like 30 minutes, the wife is sitting over there basically shaking because she wants the house. My sellers and I are stuck over here. The attorney's out in the hallway with angry husband. And they finally come back in and he stalks in and he sits down and the attorney had figured out that he was going to be happy if his name was first on the deed of trust and her name was first on all the loan docs. And the attorney reminded him, well, this means that she's first in line to pay, but you're first in line to have the house, even though North Carolina's community property. But it was so horrifying and so Are they still together is the question. I don't, I don't know. They weren't mine. And I didn't prospect them. I'd keep up with orphans, but I did not keep up with them. Because mm -hmm. frankly, I was talking to my clients under our, our hand like this, like we would like to do. And we were just figuring if he would embarrass her like that in public, what in the heck must he be like at home? But I will say this. I know that house went to foreclosure because it's on my run route and I have right. run here in Harrisburg and we saw it go to foreclosure a few years later. So I imagine she left his ass and, and let the house go. That's my guess. First to pay. He was first to own it, right? 
Mm-hmm. Did you say bless his heart? <laughs> no, it, 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 we couldn't even bless it. It was like, mm-hmm. so the other ahead. thing that yeah, happens no. during the recession, I started working with a lot of banks and doing foreclosures and I still do because I really enjoy them. And I got an assignment to this one house and I went out to it. It's a street I'd never been on because it's a street with like two trailer houses on it. And so I you, the directions say, turn off the paved road on two, which is when you always Yes, know yes Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy. We got you, you. Turn off the paved road and there's massive potholes. I went around them and I get to this gated area and I couldn't get around the gate because it's like the chain link that's this big, real thick stuff. And I carry bolt cutters in my car, but they weren't cutting that. And so I just left the car and walked around the gate, walked down to the house to do my occupancy check. And by the way, this is one of the reasons I carry my handgun when I'm doing real estate, because I look back, I'm like, you dumbass, why did you leave your car and walk down to this trailer house in the woods past a lot gate where you were by yourself? But, you know, you look back in time and realize how dumb the young you was. Yeah. The young me was 12 years ago. This is a long time ago. So anyway, I get back to the house and there's this brick wall with a little uh, cutout keyhole door in it. And I'm like, hmm. Cause it's the, the brick wall is right in front of a single wide. So I was like, see over the top here. I see it's a single wide and that little gate was closed. And so I start walking around the side and there's this massive addition. And from behind the single wide, they had built on this giant shed thing. And behind the shed thing was a two story stick built addition. So this house was a single wide plus a, giant garage outbuilding storage building plus a two-story stick built so i was looking in this addition part and it was a grow house like a massive operation grow house north carolina is still not legal for pot although i've heard you can have six plants at your house and not get arrested that's what i've heard but anyway it was a grow house and i get around to the two-story part and i did not go upstairs full disclosure because i did not know if it was trustworthy and so we're obviously in a u-shaped property there was an in-ground pool in the middle and there were needles on the ground. I went in the house and it was vacant, luckily. But still, here I am walking around, me and my guns, and on eight acres in the floodplain in the woods. Lee Brown, what were you thinking? And I went in the kitchen and there's an IV bag hanging from the breakfast room light fixture where somebody had just hooked up their own IV. It was the biggest hot mess I've ever seen. And I had to go do a BPO on that property, not to broke a price opinion. And I told the asset manager, like, you got to call me. And the asset manager called and was like, what are we dealing with? I'm like, well, it's a trailer and a garage and a house and a pool. And I'm not really sure that anything had a permit ever. And it's in the floodplain, like the actually floods floodplain, not the FEMA made up version. It was something. I've never seen anything like that. And I wish it was in the era of an iPhone because iPhone had just come out and I was still next tail. I was next tail as long as I could. I wish I'd have had some digital photos of that property because that was something else. Well, then it, it got better because as I came back out to my car, the neighbor trailer nearby who was outside with his gun in his hand wanted to know what I was doing back there. And I said, sir, I'm a realtor and I'm back here to look at it. It's gone to foreclosure. And he said, you can't go back there. I said, why come? And he said, because I own the driveway. Well, he was the one that had put up that gate because this house was completely landlocked, did not own the driveway. And so the bank had to buy the driveway from Mr. Neighbor Trailer with the gun so we could get access to it to sell it. And it was a mess. Oh, that house was crazy. But actually, I look back at that one, and it was not just the crazy house. It was like, crazy, stupid, Lee, you weren't smart then. I'm much smarter now because now I'm Very I much so because that's dangerous as all right. get out. Right? Yeah. All right, so somebody wants to come to the Cabarrus County. Why should they choose Lee Brown and Associates? Well, they're actually going to be choosing one community real estate because as of February 1st, for the first time in my career, I'll be somewhere besides Remax, which is really hard to adjust to when you spent your whole career there. But the most exciting thing is that in creating this firm, I wanted to build a firm that addresses who I am as a realtor and the kind of realtors with whom I want to affiliate. And that's the professionals who are focused on providing a different experience in their community. And that's not just through the buying and selling of real estate and through providing professional counsel, but being full-time advocates, whether it's in nonprofit world or in political advocacy. So our whole mission statement is built on happy agents who are advocates for their clients and communities. And so we don't, 
need to focus on the technology. There's plenty of technology. We have all the right tools. We're not going to worry about money because the money will find us. We're going to focus on taking care of our communities. So if you want the realtor who's thinking about you as more than a transaction and more than a commission because they know that you are more than houses, and that's why you're going to call Lee Brown and her amazing team of people because I have the best people ever. In fact, they're better at real estate than I am, probably because I trained them, but you know, also because they're awesome. And we love, we love it. It's fun. I got 20 years to go to Realtor Emeritus. I'm halfway there. So I'm going to get my Emeritus pin in just 20 short years. What's amazing to me is, is, you know, Lou was on and broke, broke on the show that uh, we we're going to have a Mayberry's downtown. Uh, Lee, you're on and you're telling me that after 20 years, you're leaving the company that you actually own a little bit of and have started a new company and it's called again, what? One Community Real Estate. All right. So you're going to get me that contact information so we can share it with everybody here. And um, I just can't thank you enough. Uh, You are a great uh, asset to our industry. I appreciate everything that you do for our industry, but even for me, it's, it's important for that. I say that, as I said, you grab that rung on the ladder because you've climbed up higher than me and you always reach back. And one of the most uh, fun things that I can tell you I've had happen so far in, in my early presidency with Winston Salem is, is I've appointed some very, very new realtors that didn't even know they wanted to be involved. Um, and uh, they're loving it. And I've got people coming up and saying, hey, can I get involved? Can I get involved? And you have to hand up the people and get, if they want the opportunity. And I've learned that from people like you. And I can't thank you enough for being with me on Camel City Chat today. You know, actually think about it. We're not even reaching back on the ladder. We're just reaching behind and pushing the door open. That's all it is. Because we're on the same level. Yeah. We just let the door wider and bring people in. Well, I, I appreciate everything you've done, not only for me, but for everybody else. And so uh, we'll put up your contact information there. Of course, like us on YouTube and Facebook and, and uh, five stars because John needs five stars. Uh, please, please. And uh, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. And uh, thanks for being here today on Camel City Chat. Thank you for serving Winston-Salem and uh, probably all the surrounding communities too. All right. Well, we'll see you soon. Okay. Take thanks, care. John.